All right. So describe the Supremacy Act of 1534. So as we're moving to England, talking about the Reformation there, okay, it comes about in a different way, right, than the Protestant Reformation, which we already talked about with Martin Luther. So in England, this Reformation kicks off in an odd way, right? We talked about that already. And then uh, I want you to talk a little bit about the pilgrimage of grace in 1536. So maybe something spurred from this event here with the Supremacy Act. Maybe some people weren't too happy with this on the way, but separation from the Catholic Church. And then finally, I'd like you to talk a little bit about Bloody Mary. So we talked a bit about her yesterday. I didn't get to the slide where it really detailed more about her life, but we'll get to that today. All right, so there you go. You guys work on this for a minute or two. I'm going to come around and check your bell ringers for this week. So as you're finishing up, I'll come around and check these and give you a grade for them. <laughs> hey, we're recording, man. We're going on the bell ringer. Today's the 14th. Uh, I'm going to check these as you're finishing up here. <coughs> Thank you. 
All right, so the Act of Supremacy, 1534, what was this all about? What was it all about? We already talked about the Wars of the Roses, the conflict between the families, the Lancasters and Yorks, over the English crown. It lasted for close to 100 years, and uh, this resulted in Henry Tudor, part of the Lancaster family, come back and take the throne. He's also the father of Henry VIII, right? That's one thing to note with this civil war, the lead right up to Henry VIII's reign as king. All right, so with the act of supremacy, what happened here? What happened? Go ahead, Amelia. Yeah, good, good. So with Henry VIII, right, we all know that he wanted to try to have a male heir to the throne. And his first wife wasn't cut it out for him, right? So he wanted to divorce her. Who had an issue with this? Who said no? Connor? The Pope. The Pope. Yeah, good job. So um, the Holy Roman Empire, the Catholic Church, they said, no, we're not going to allow this to happen. And one of the biggest reasons why, if you think about it, the princess was from Spain, and if England and Spain are united through this marriage, is there a chance of war between the two? Probably not, right? So that's one thing to know. Maybe the Pope was looking at this as a way to prevent warfare between the two powers. And anything, we all know that Henry VIII, to try to get a new wife, to divorce his wife, he breaks away from the Catholic Church. Okay, so we talked about the Reformation, in Central Europe, in Germany, more, you know, more or less in modern-day Germany, with Martin Luther, 95 Theses, and how the Protestant Reformation occurred to break away from the Catholic Church. And there's many different perspectives that emerged from that, with the Calvinist viewpoint and uh, Zwingli, right, his viewpoints of religion and how that differed from the Catholic Church. Here in England, it happens in a different way, right? Henry VIII just wanted to have a separation with his wife, and that's where we see England break off from the Catholic so with that, he creates uh, and he forms himself as the power of the English church and also the monarch of England, right? So he is all-powerful in England. He has clear separation from the church. All right, so with that, obviously not everybody's going to be too happy, right? This structure has been around for hundreds of years, and many of these people followed suit with what the Catholic church uh, had to offer in England. And uh, as soon as he changed his structure, this might change the lives of many people, obviously. So this caused the pilgrimage of grace in 1536. What happened here? What happened? What was this all about? Pilgrimage of grace. Go ahead, Parker. Yeah, good job. Yeah, so plain and simple, this is a revolt, right? This is a rebellion over Henry VIII's breakaway from the Catholic Church. Okay, again, you can imagine how this was a structure of people's lives for hundreds of years, and all of a sudden, the king comes in, and because of his own personal views, he breaks off from the church. So yeah, he still provided the structure of what Catholicism brought when it came to church services, and when it came to moral values that the church applied to the society. He didn't change any of that, and he tried to forbid any of these new, let's say, revolutionary ideas that emerged from the Protestant Revolution to enter England. So overall, right, when you're looking at his structure, a lot of people work for him, and uh, this caused a rebellion. And he killed many of these people that opposed him, 
Obviously, as a king, you want to make sure you can squash these rebellions and utilize the military in your advantage and make sure that you don't lose the throne. So this is why he's viewed as a tyrant. This is why he's viewed as an uh, absolute monarch, a king in a way that is very bloodthirsty. Because he just squashed any rebellion that came around. He burned people at the stakes. He executed by obviously having their heads locked off. And this all came really from this pilgrimage of grace. Okay, all right. And then we talked a little bit about Henry the Eighth. He obviously is not going to live forever. And uh, eventually, his male, obviously, heir, his son, will come to the throne, Edward the Sixth. And with Edward the Sixth, we all know that he was what? Was he a young or old king? Go ahead, Connor. The young sixth guy. Yeah, yeah, right? He was very young, right? He didn't have really the ability to push a lot of these reforms in England on his own. And he was guided by some advisors to push for this reformation in England. And as this Protestant reformation was changing England, England, okay, this was, you know, obviously caused a lot of turmoil for some people. And especially Mary Tudor, which is the first daughter of Henry VIII. So Edward, yeah, he was real young. And you really can't blame it all on him, I guess you could say, for this drastic change in England when it came to this reformation period. It was more his advisors, because he was just too young to make the decisions for his own. So he ends up dying, and then Mary comes into play. She becomes queen. She's the first daughter of Henry VIII. And what happens here with Mary Tudor? She has a nickname. What was her nickname again? Uh, go ahead, why? Bloody Mary. Bloody Mary. Yeah, good job. And what did she do right away as she used to become a queen? What did she try to do? How did she get the nickname? Parker? Yeah, good, good. She was trying to literally reverse everything that was happening under Edward and really Henry's rule when it came to changing of this Protestant religion. Okay, she wanted to bring back the Holy Roman Empire. She wanted to bring back the Catholic Church to England. And she tried to reverse this in many ways, obviously, with brutal methods of killing off many of these Protestants, burning them alive, chopping their heads off in many of these open areas for people to see, and uh, try to lead it as an example. But was she successful? No. If anything, she actually did more to harm the good for her cause, right? She actually pushed more people to search for Protestantism. And it really created more of an evil of the Catholic Church than anything for the people of England. So with this Reformation, yeah, it was going through some crazy changes here in England. And it led to a lot of death. All right, so then we talked about another queen. So after Bloody Mary died, another queen comes into play. What's her name? What's her name? Go ahead, Batista. Elizabeth I. Elizabeth I. Good job. And we're going to talk a little bit about her today with the Elizabeth, Elizabethan era, the golden age of England. Okay, so that's what I want to mention a little bit more today. And uh, real quick, I want to finish these slides with that, and then we'll jump back to the vocab to talk more about the Catholic Reformation. So this is where we finished up yesterday with Bloody Mary. I just wanted to put this slide up because I think it's pretty helpful of understanding a little bit what she was all about. So again, with Bloody Mary, she wanted to restore the rule of the Pope. She wanted to bring the Catholic Church back to England. And she wanted to uh, be reunited with the Catholic. So all that change that happened under Henry VIII and Edward VI, well, she was trying to reverse it. And like I mentioned, she probably did a little bit more harm than good in many cases because more people just viewed Catholicism as this corrupt, this blood, uh, this bloody religion, literally. And she was killing many people that were trying to kick back against this movement to the Catholic Church. So she married Prince Philip of Spain, which, again, if you're the Catholic Church, if you're the Pope, you want this to happen. You want to try to see unity amongst these countries. Well, yeah, no problem. Yeah. Off to not heavy off. Okay, so then Protestants burned to death. Oh no. Oh no. So like I mentioned, this is how she gets the nickname Bloody Mary. Wild stuff. Oh. Don't say your name three times looking in a mirror in a dark room. Don't do that. Anyway, just joking. Just joking. All right, so Elizabeth I. So with Elizabeth I, she comes into play after Bloody Mary. And like I mentioned, she wants to try to distance herself from a lot of the anarchy, the chaos that was under Henry VIII, and obviously with uh, Bloody Mary. So again, with Henry VIII, the six wives, and killing many of these people that revolted against his rule, 
know, we just already talked about Bloody Mary. A lot of people really weren't particularly happy with the crown. So she wants to change that. And she's known as the Virgin Queen. What colony, that state, named after her? Oh, go ahead. Virginia. Virginia. Yeah, good job. Good job. So, as you know, with the age of exploration, it will kick off under her rule in England. Right. And this is why it's prompted as England becoming this, you know, obviously moving into this golden age. So under Henry VIII, we talked a little bit about how he expands the military and creates it into a stronger, obviously more powerful naval force. And this is going to lead England into this prosperous age in this almost pre-imperialistic age. But Elizabeth I is known for not getting married because you don't want to make a lot of mistakes here, obviously, of that. Of Henry VIII, she said, I'm married to the people of England. I'm married to the man of England. And the reason for it is because she wanted to be this direct leader that people could follow. She tried to keep religion and politics separate. She tried to do her best to do that because, again, this only creates division within England. And for the time of her monarchy, of her leadership, she did a great job at uniting England and bringing it together. So with Elizabeth I, Okay, her role and term that I had to use right now yesterday is polity. So again, taking the middle road, compromise between the religions of Protestantism and Catholicism, and make sure that they can bring people together rather than constantly look at this division within England. So overall, she was a very, very strong monarch. And like I mentioned, she was embracing Renaissance artists in England, one of them being Shakespeare. Right? We talked about Shakespeare already during the Renaissance period. And this is bringing a sense of culture to it, right? And uh, making it obviously a lovely place to be and trying to bring out its dominance at the world stage and expanding it and looking to explore, right? And like I mentioned, that's going to bring on the golden age of the Carol, go ahead. Two things. One, there's a meeting of her with the, the Vietnamese people, right? Yeah. It's a very famous meeting. And two, um, she allowed Mary Queen of Scots to be in her refuge, even though she was executed her later on for charges of trying to throw her over the throne. Yeah. And stuff like that. Oh, all right. You want to find that painting of the Spanish Armada? You want to bring that up? Okay. Yeah, so we will talk about it here soon, probably next chapter when we talk about these absolute monarchies, but she will defeat the Spanish Armada. So obviously, this linkage is bondage between Spain and England. It won't last too long. And there will be war between the countries as the Catholic Church is dwindling in power. And that's going to lead us to our next topic, which I want to talk about today with the Counter-Reformation, the Catholic Reformation. All right, let's see where we're at. Uh, you guys can watch this on your own. It's just a speech by Elizabeth I. It's linked into the presentation. So I think it's interesting. It just shows really how strong of a leader she was and how she was trying to put the bickering to the side between the religions. I don't know why it's cut off up there. It's weird. All right, but anyway, here are your terms for today. Oh, real quick, guys. You can find this chart. I linked this chart for the Reformation onto the video lesson from yesterday. You can find it at the very bottom. So if you click on this chart, it will just give a little bit more detail about the viewpoints of religion, the, the uh, factions of Christianity that emerged during this Reformation period. It even talks about some of the founders, right? And details a little bit more about the uh, protests, role of the Bible, church governance, salvation. Right? I think it's interesting to note. And I think it's something that you guys might find obviously helpful when it comes to talking about some of these perspectives of Christianity. Like I said, that's linked on to the video lesson from yesterday. You can find it at the bottom of the video lesson. And uh, again, I think it's helpful. I think it's interesting to learn about too. So you can see the different perspectives of religion right here up at the top of Christianity. Go ahead. Oh, you got it? Okay. How about I bring it up towards the end of class? Is that okay? All right. I can have you screen mirror. All right. Here are your terms for today. All right. Like I mentioned, I want to talk about the counter-reformation, the Catholic Reformation, and how they need to do a little bit of changing, especially when it comes to their rule. Right here, the Protestant Reformation is kicking off. England's going through their own Reformation. And uh, we see these branches of religion, of Christianity emerging throughout Europe. So it's important that Catholicism still has a deep root in Europe. And 
this is where it occurs. This is where it happens. All right, so since we're running low on time here, uh, I'm going to move on. Uh, does everybody have the terms, or should I just talk about the terms? Is that okay? I'll just leave the terms up, and you can just continue to define them. I just want to talk about them. All right, so the Counter-Reformation, known as the Catholic Reformation, and we all know with the Protestant Reformation occurring, uh, with Martin Luther and the challenges against the Catholic Church, the 95 Theses, the obviously against the indulgences, and really the leadership of the Catholic Church, okay, this is prompting a lot of change throughout Europe. And a lot of people start to see a new viewpoint of Christianity, new perspectives of Christianity, that has directly challenged the Catholic Church. And then we have the English Reformation. So we have Henry VIII breaking away from the Roman Catholic Church. So if you're the Catholic Church, the Pope, are you rising in power or declining in power during this time? Are you rising or declining in power? Go ahead, why? Say declining. Yeah, declining for sure, right? You see how a lot of these factions are breaking off. And at one point, you have firm control of really all of Europe. And uh, now that's starting to break away. Now these new perspectives of religion are starting to emerge, of Christianity in particular. So with that, the corruption of the church is being prevalent. And that needs to change, right? That needs to change. So this movement, the counter-reformation, Catholic Reformation was a way to try to build trust back into the Catholic Church to provide even more power towards the Pope, the 
bring it back, in other words. And the way they do that is through many different measures, a lot of it through education, a lot of it through reform methods of really taking away the indulgences, focusing more on the leadership of the Catholic Church. So the Roman Inquisition, what do we have? What do we got? So it's a lot like the Spanish Inquisition. What do we got? Caroline, do you have this term here? The Roman Inquisition. Yeah, good, good. So they see this viewpoints of Protestants, uh, Protestantism emerging in Europe, and their goal is to try to remove it, to try to take it out. Uh, the views of heretics of the Catholic Church, they need to be removed, they need to be killed. So these, this is literally mass killings of a lot of these people that might represent Protestantism as a viewpoint, as a focal point of religion. You know, let's say Jews, for instance, Muslims, any views against the Catholic Church, they will be brutally killed. And this, like I said, goes along with the Spanish Inquisition as they're trying to take out any rival religion, any viewpoints that might differ from their own. And like I mentioned, it's literally like a genocide. So Ignatius of Loyola, we have here. Go ahead, why? Uh, Spanish Catholic priest and theology. Theologian, yeah. And that. Uh, with your favor of Francis Xavier, they found you the Disorder of Society of Jesus. Yeah, good job. So the Jesuits, okay, the Society of Jesus, okay, they are pushing for change within the Catholic Church. They want to reform it. And the best way to do that is establishing a learning place, schools for people to accept Catholicism as their main religion, and to make sure that this doesn't continue to break away from the Catholic Church. Again, it's trying to build more pride and unity within the Catholic Church. And he's one of these founders that is pushing for this counter-reformation. He sees the trust, the loyalty of the people, you know, leaving the Catholic Church. And the only way to try to reverse that is to provide teachings and uh, provide schools for the people to learn more about the Catholic religion. And to set up a sense of principles for the people to fall through with, okay? Obviously, to end the corruption of these religious leaders. So overall, he's trying to reform the Catholic Church in a better viewpoint. I'm sure you guys watch the NCAA basketball March Madness, right? Loyola, Chicago, you guys ever hear that team? Well, it's named after, yeah, obviously. This term, this term here, which I think is interesting to know. And it is a Catholic school. Chris, you had your hand up. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's pronounced theologian. Theologian? Yeah. I thought I said that. It's like theologian. That was yeah. something like that. Was that. Why. Uh, I, I know you didn't say theologian. Okay, sorry, Chris. Say theologian? theologian? Jesuits, what do we got? What do we got? Jesuits. We have the Jesuits. Go ahead, Connor. A member of the Society of Jesus. Yeah, good job. So, with. Ignatius of Loyola, he's pushing for the Society of Jesus, a prompt, more, uh, you know, more uh, stronger look toward the Catholic Church, and to provide a stability, a structure to the Catholic Church. Again, with the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation happening in Europe, the English Reformation, you need to try to bring unity back to the Pope. You try to need to bring power back to the Catholic Church. And the only way to do that is through reform, and that is what Ignatius of Loyola is trying to do. All right, Council of Trent, last one here. Council of Trent. What do we got for the Council of Trent? Aaron, you have this term? Oh. All right. We'll talk more about it on the Why? See you guys later. What's that? <laughs> I guess so. Saved by the bell, right? Oh, okay. I'll show it Monday then, okay? Thank you, Carolyn. Yeah. Yeah, yeah.